Hello, welcome. I'm Barbara Burtness. I'm a medical oncologist at the Yale Cancer Center in New Haven, Connecticut. I'm interested in um, treatment of head and neck cancer, including of nasopharyngeal cancer. Patients who have either recurrent or metastatic nasopharyngeal carcinoma have um, historically had uh, median survivals that were under two years. And the treatment involving uh, chemotherapy with gemcitabine and cisplatin clearly had uh, a number of side effects as well. These patients may be struggling with after effects of chemo radiation, um, the hearing loss, uh, sometimes temporal lobe necrosis, sometimes osteonecrosis, certainly dry mouth, recurrent sinusitis. And um, so into, the, into this setting where patients may be symptomatic from their prior treatment, maybe symptomatic from the recurrent or uh, metastatic presentation of the nasopharyngeal carcinoma. We then come with a chemotherapy-based treatment that historically had not had a uh, very long median survival. And so this is uh, where the need for newer therapies, including immunotherapies, uh, was perceived. Well, there have been a number of randomized trials now with various uh, PD-1 inhibitors in the first-line setting for recurrent metastatic uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And the, the largest uh, was the JUPITER-2 trial. This was a study that compared the reference regimen of cisplatin and gemcitabine for six cycles to the same regimen with the addition of toripalumab and then followed after the conclusion of the six cycles by um, maintenance uh, toripalumab. And uh, that study was uh, quite remarkable for the activity that it demonstrated. Um, the uh, median progression-free survival with the uh, use of toripalumab uh, as opposed to placebo in that study was 11.7 compared with a PFS of eight months in the, in the control arm. Um, if you looked at two-year results, the uh, two-year progression-free survival went from 25 to 45%. Uh, the um, overall survival was also uh, markedly uh, improved by the addition of uh, toripalumab. So you saw the median go from 33.7 months in the uh, control arm, which was already very long compared with historical standards and suggests that there was some crossover on second line, um, to a median survival that had not been reached. And at three years, the overall survival rate went from 50 to 65%. Uh, so um, this was a, a remarkable difference in, in both progression-free survival and overall survival. And the therapy was, was quite well tolerated. Uh, there were no new safety signals relative to the experiences we'd had with let's say, pembrolizumab and, and chemotherapy and other uh, head and neck cancer sites. Um, if you looked at the uh, forest plot uh, across the subgroup analyses, whether looking at age, uh, gender, comparing recurrent disease or, or metastatic disease, whether the patients had had a long or a short disease-free interval after their definitive treatment, what their baseline performance status was, um, and even what their baseline EBV copy number was, um, the uh, toripalumab arm benefited across all of those subgroups. There have been um, some other trials. Uh, Cambrilizumab is another uh, PD-1 inhibitor. It's also been compared in a, a smaller randomized trial um, that uh, also showed a benefit in progression-free survival. It's an agent that may have a, a little bit of a different side effect profile. And then we saw the Rationale 309 trial, which looked at tislilizumab, um, versus placebo, again, on the on the backbone gemcitabine cisplatin regimen. And here there was an improvement in uh, PFS from 7.4 to 9.6 months and 12-month uh, uh, overall survival, uh, not yet very mature, but uh, edging up a little bit for the tislilizumab arm as well. So I think uh, across a number of agents, we've seen a consistent signal that uh, the addition of a PD-1 inhibitor to gemcitabine cisplatin chemotherapy improves progression-free survival and overall survival. And uh, the, uh, the, the largest trial, I think the cleanest trial in terms of toxicity, and the one that has gained FDA approval in the United States um, is the JUPITER-2 trial that used toripalumab. In, in evaluating patients for the addition of a PD-1 inhibitor to chemotherapy in first-line treatment for recurrent metastatic nasopharyngeal carcinoma, 
that I think if, as you look at the forest plot, there really was not a subgroup of eligible patients in that trial who did not benefit. Um, so the, the study was confined to patients with good performance status, patients who were candidates for gemcitabine and cisplatin. Uh, the question would be, if you had a patient who was not a platinum candidate, would, uh, you know, what would the level of comfort be in using gemcitabine uh, carboplatin uh, instead? Um, and I think that that's something uh, where you need to do some shared decision making with the patient because the, the body of evidence isn't as extensive there. Um, the I, I think the other consideration with immune checkpoint inhibitors is always, is the patient a candidate for immunotherapy? And, and the patients in whom we uh, want to avoid or at least defer immunotherapy are those who have underlying autoimmune disorders that uh, would be highly likely to make make them ill if we were to move forward with the immunotherapy. So patients with Crohn's disease and lupus and um, interstitial lung disease, uh, you know, um, may have undue toxicity. That that is not to say that they might not respond well to the use of an immune checkpoint inhibitor, but the the toxicity might not be worth it at least in the in the first line setting. But in terms of subsite of disease, um, disease free interval, um, gender, age, the, there were no indications that there were groups that were not benefiting from the addition of toripalumab. The initial studies with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors in nasopharyngeal carcinoma were actually done in previously treated patients. And there are uh, a number of studies that gave, gave extremely consistent uh, results. So the Polaris II trial was a single arm phase two study that investigated toripalumab in previously treated recurrent metastatic uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So um, like the, the first line study, these, these patients had a good performance status um, and they uh, had been eligible for platinum type platinum based chemotherapy in the first line. And in this study, patients received toripalumab um, on an every two week schedule on, until disease progression, uh, death, or intolerable toxicity. And this showed an objective response rate of 20.5%, a median duration of response of 12.8 months, and a median overall survival of 17 months. And, and those were impressive data in a setting where previously we had been working with single agent taxane, cetuximab, um, and, and other approaches that, that were not achieving overall survivals uh, uh, greater than a year. Um, there was also a randomized study in the same setting. This was the Keynote 122 trial that compared pembrolizumab monotherapy to um, chemotherapy. The, the uh, chemotherapy was a dealer's choice approach, uh, could be capecitabine, gemcitabine, or docetaxel. Um, pembrolizumab was given every three weeks and uh, again until disease progression, intolerable toxicity or death. Here the response rate for pembrolizumab was very similar at 21.4% and that compared to 23.3% for um, chemotherapy. The uh, median progression-free survival here was quite similar, uh, 4.1 uh, months for pembrolizumab. And then looking at the median overall survival, this was 15.3 months for chemotherapy and 17.2 months for pembrolizumab. Hazard ratio there was 0 0.9. So that was a negative study in terms of showing that pembrolizumab was superior to chemotherapy, but it was very consistent with the um, effects that had been seen in the um, in the toripalumab study in terms of uh, what the response rate and the, and the median progression-free survival were. There are uh, also um, two trials that were done with nivolumab uh, monotherapy, the Checkmate 358 trial that showed an objective response rate of 20.8 months and um, median progression-free survival of 2.4 months, and an NCI trial uh, that showed an objective response rate of 20.5% uh, and uh, one-year PFS of 19.3%. So again, very consistent results, um, all three of these agents showing a response rate just over 20%, and um, all of them appearing to impact uh, progression-free survival and uh, overall survival, uh, although in the randomized setting, not superior to chemotherapy for these patients. So I think that for patients who are not able to get toripalumab in the first line, one could think of um, a, a PD-1 inhibitor in second line as an additional tool. I 
think that the first and, and primary guide here is whether or not a immune checkpoint inhibitor was used in the first line setting. And so uh, clearly the, the studies, the Polaris study, the Keynote 122, and the nivolumab studies, these um, were done in patients who had not previously seen an immune checkpoint inhibitor. So the, the principal use of an immune checkpoint inhibitor in second and later line settings is um, in, in patients who had not received first line um, therapy. In the second line setting, and this is a little different to the first line setting in combination with chemotherapy, but using these agents as monotherapy in the second line setting, there is a hint that higher PDL1 expression predicts a higher response rate. And, and so I think um, you'd be particularly keen to use an immune checkpoint inhibitor here for someone who had a PDL1 expressing cancer. Um, and then all of the same considerations about. Uh, uh, using immune checkpoint inhibitors with caution in patients who have underlying autoimmune dis disease uh, pertain. And so um, I think, you know, increasingly the reason a patient might not have seen an immune checkpoint inhibitor in the first line setting would be that they did have an autoimmune condition and that the immune checkpoint inhibitor had been held. And um, so I think here, uh, when you're saying, are you going to use it in the second line setting, are you going to use it in the third line setting, uh, it, you might uh, again, take that into consideration. And if the patient had not yet had a trial of uh, docetaxel, say, or capecitabine, uh, for the patient with autoimmune dis disease, you might hold the immune checkpoint inhibitor a little bit longer. The, the first and most important um, guardrail, I think, is a well-informed patient. So helping the patient to understand what the side effects of a PD-1 inhibitor might be, um, what are the things that we want to know about right away. So um, if a patient develops diarrhea and they may previously have had diarrhea as a side effect of chemotherapy and just managed it with Imodium, um, you know, making sure that the patient understands the severity of immune-related colitis. Um, we encourage our patients to call us instead of let's say, going to an urgent care center because we know what they're on and, and we're familiar with the management of Im immune-related toxicity. Um, we, we do, uh, you know, get a baseline troponin cardiogram on all of our patients. We um, check baseline liver function tests. Um, and so I think it's a combination of uh, trying to screen out patients who are at high risk keeping the patient informed and making sure that we're part of the response if the patient does develop side effects. The interesting thing about uh, the work that's been done to look at the effectiveness of immune checkpoint inhibitors in nasopharyngeal cancer, and this is not surprising given that most nasopharyngeal cancer is, is EBV related, but uh, the majority of these trials have been done in Asia or in patients who are um, have EBV associated uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Um, to the extent that um, we have been able to understand whether or not the approach works in non-EBV related uh, nasopharyngeal cancer, it appears to. In the Jupiter 2, there are a small number of patients who uh, appeared not to have EBV-related uh, nasopharynx cancer, and, and that did not emerge as a predictor of, of non-response. And I think that's not surprising because um, the other forms of head and neck cancer, um, both HPV-associated and, and non-viral uh, head and neck cancer, are responsive to chemotherapy and um, PD-1 in, inhibitor combinations. So in the Keynote 048 trial, uh, uh, cisplatin 5-FU uh, pembrolizumab combination was quite active in those other forms of head and neck cancer. So I think it's not surprising that PD-1 inhibitor would be beneficial whether or not EBV was present. Um, we understand the EBV-related cancers to have a particularly immune-infiltrated uh, microenvironment that, that we think supports response to immunotherapy. Um, and so if you had a non-EBV-related uh, nasopharyngeal cancer that was also pdl one negative, uh, the group, you know, where the addition of pembrolizumab anyway has, has not been as beneficial, um, that might give you pause about uh, using an immune checkpoint inhibitor in, in the first-line setting. And then I, I guess the other thing to say is that the advantage of gemcitabine over 5-fluorouracil uh, um, 
in the in the chemotherapy combination is not established for uh, non EBV related malignancy. So if it was not EBV related and you wanted to go more with a, a platinum five few or platinum taxane approach, I think that would be reasonable as well. For nasopharyngeal cancer, as as I think for many cancers, one of the most uh, exciting new immunotherapy targets is LAG3. Um, so we have, have seen the um, activity of, of these combinations in um, melanoma, in uh, non-small cell lung cancer. The anti-LAG3 antibody LBL007 was combined with anti-PD-1 therapy uh, with or without chemotherapy in um, in a trial that was presented at, at ASCO this year in, in 2024. And um, uh, this was a phase one, two study. Uh, and in the uh, combination of chemotherapy with the LAG3 inhibitor and tizlilizumab, um, safety looked good. And the objective response rate was about 90% with disease control of 100% and three, three month progression free survival of over 95%. So um, that looked extremely exciting. Um, we've also seen um, the uh, combination of PD-1 inhibitors with other targeted therapies, for example, anti-angiogenic uh, agents, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, coming out of Asia with very high response rates. So I think for, um, uh, you know, either for patients whose recurrence comes pretty shortly after they've completed chemoradiation um, or for, um, for patients who are not necessarily great cisplatin candidates, um, clinical trials with some of these newer combinations, I think, are very appealing for patients. And then, as with with any therapy that's extremely active in the recurrent metastatic setting, of course, we're keen to understand how to um, advance this towards uh, the definitive setting. And there have been a number of randomized trials, uh, no overall survival data yet, but. Uh, event-free survival rates looking very favorable for the addition of uh, PD-1 inhibitors to chemoradiation. I think we'll be hearing more about that in the future. 